Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I want to ask you a very weird question. Can you look at your hands? Just look at them. That means you're alive. <laughs> I am alive today because I had to run away from home, Mexico, because I am a journalist and I'm a human rights activist. They tried to kill me. They went in how inside my house, killed my dogs, and tried to kill me. And I had to flee last July. That was the seventh time in my life as a journalist that I had to flee my home uh, in order to stay alive. I'm not going to depress you, I swear. Not more than a, we already have a little bit. Um, so I want to talk to you about what it means for a lot of us to be journalists that have become activists and that are aware that is the new journalism that is truly saving our communities. And if we do that all over the world, we will end up changing the narrative of journalism and using um, the media uh, as a revolutionary tool. And that's what we have been trying to do. That's what I do. And I will tell you a short story about this. In, uh, I began uh, doing journalism in uh, 30 years ago. Um, and the first pieces I wrote about were, were about uh, violence against women. And then I started writing about how the government of Quintana Roo, where Cancun is, in the southeast of Mexico, uh, were not giving um, medicine to people with HIV in a touristic area in which there was a lot of sex tourism and specifically male prostitution. And the governor called my house. My poor ex-husband had to answer the phone to threaten me because I was telling a lie. This is 25 years ago. He had to use the phone. Back then, he didn't have Twitter. So he had to use the phone, and he called me. He said, in my state, that does not happen. And I answered, well, in your state, it doesn't happen. In my country, in my state, it happens, and I have the facts. And that's what I published. And the next day, I published that. The governor just uh, called me and threatened me for like two weeks. It was the first experience in my life to have this. For like two weeks, I had this policeman outside my house following me everywhere because, uh, well, because I was a threat to the governor, apparently, because I was talking about HIV AIDS. So what happened later was that a lot of people started coming to the newspaper. And young people, young men, started coming to the newspaper and asking for this weird feminist journalist called Lydia Cacho that was writing about their rights and telling the stories and chronicles and talking about the, the um, social security and talking about the hospitals that were denying them service. And then all of a sudden, I had all these young men in my office at the, I mean, uh, at the, at the newspaper. And then my editor-in-chief called me, and he goes, Lydia, get them out of here. So I got out in the street, and I was like, so aware of what being a journalist was. That was the first time in my life that I thought, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. <laughs> I am so, um, um, so aware of the fact that my education and the ethics and the values that my parents and everyone around me gave me when I was a little girl uh, were, became possible, became a reality as a journalist. So I helped these kids, and I said, listen, we have to open something. So we ended up opening this house where they could get the health services. And I, you know, I kept writing about these things. And then somebody picked it up in a new, on a newspaper in Mexico City. And these people that were working with people with HIV AIDS helped them. And there were no social networks back then, apparently, not technological social networks. So everybody gathered together, and this hospital, little hospital, became a reality in Cancun. So after that, my husband kept saying, you know, this is, this is what true journalism should do. Always, always remember this. 
Years passed by, I kept on writing and investigating, and one day in 2003, this young girl escaped a man that was raping her, and she was 14 years old. And uh, I started investigating the case, and, and then all of a sudden I found out there were more and more girls and boys that were abused and exploited, sexually exploited, in a fancy hotel in Cancun, and not all of them were Mexican. Some of them were American, some of them were middle class, and all of a sudden, I, I knew it was something bigger than I ever thought. So I went to the authorities in Mexico City, to the special um, team, uh, apparently specialized <laughs> in crimes against children, and uh, there weren't cyber crimes uh, specialists back then, but they, they were supposedly experts in organized crime and knew about human trafficking. So I went there to interview them and ask them what should the government do? What should the police do with these cases? And all of a sudden they just laugh at me and they go like, are you crazy? You're making this up. Uh, there's no way, there's, uh, there's child pornography in Mexico the way you said. I mean, these kids must be lying, right? So I went back and I got inside the hotel of this guy uh, I got some information. I interviewed all these people. I had a, a TV program back then. I told the whole story in the TV program, and then they fired me from the TV station uh, because these guys were really rich and powerful and friends of the governor. So I found out why they fired me, and I knew I, all the names of the governors involved, five governors involved in the child pornography network, four senators and I don't know how many hundreds of clients that they brought in and out from these fancy hotels to have sex with children from four years old to 14. So I investigated the whole thing, and then I started writing about it in the newspaper, and then the newspaper said, listen, Lydia, you know, this is really dangerous, and I went back to the federal police chief, and I asked him, how can we get into the place where they are sharing their information. And he goes, oh, are you crazy? They use these special programs, one called Thor. You have to be a hacker. Nobody uh, should be a hacker. It's a crime. And you know, this is not going to spread. You know, this is 2003. And you know, internet is not, not going to be as powerful as you think. Um, and of course, uh, this child pornography is not going to be as big as you think it's going to become. So I decided to prove him wrong by searching for the facts and believing all the stories the children were, were telling me. So I map out, whenever, whenever, I, whenever I work in one of my books, I have 16 books now, um, I map out everything. I have all the names of everyone. It's like what the maps that you saw there, I have that in my mind. That's what I do, and I bring it there. So anyway, I got all the names of everyone, and I started investigating these guys, and I ended up writing this book called Demons of Eden, my editors wanted to sell the book, so they call it that. But um, in the book, I named the names of everyone involved. But before that, in order to do the book, to write the, the book and to get the facts, I went to find somebody that could hack the deep web. Because back then, it wasn't that easy. Now, nowadays, it's just like you know something you do. But uh, back then, it wasn't that easy. So uh, I went you know, looking for these guys until I found this very young guy and I asked him, you know, are you really a hacker? And he said, I can't tell you. And as I showed him the evidence I gathered and I said, I need to go into the deep web to prove these guys are connected and they are sharing all this information and child pornography and all the, their pictures and their um, videos having sex with these kids, but also the parties, which I didn't know, that they were having with kids, alcohol, bankers, and political party leaders. So he said, OK, I'll help you. He taught me. I became a hacker. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and um, I hacked them. And I, all of a sudden, I got into this world that I've never imagined in my entire life. I thought this was so overwhelming. I went straight to my 
Finally, I went straight to my therapist, and I was like, I cannot handle what I have in my head after watching these uh, adults raping children and enjoying and partying over it and making business while they do it and celebrating. So I wrote the book. When I wrote the book, I had already had uh, seven death threats. One lawyer from one of the businessmen came to my office at the uh, magazine I was working as an editor, and he put a gun in my face in front of the secretary, and he said, stop writing. And then I got all these calls, and one of the calls was like, if you, if you keep writing about this case, your father will receive your body in little pieces in a bag, in a trash bag. And, um, and I told my family, I'm going to write the book, and this, this is, these are the threats, this is the danger, you know, but I'm going to do it. And all my family said, do it. We are behind you. My dad, my, my sisters and brothers, and my nieces. And, and uh, most of my friends said, you're crazy, don't do it. Mainly, my male friends said no. My female friends said, yes, go for it. So, you know. Anyway, I published a book, and six months later, I'm out of, outside my office. These guys came, closed the, in the street, um, dressed as civilians, these guys with guns took me, and they put me in a car, and they arrested me. <laughs> later, we found out they were policemen ordered by one governor that was involved in this network. And they tortured me for 20 hours. They took me from Cancun to the city of Puebla near Mexico City. They tortured me during those 20 hours. And they were going to kill me. But they did not kill me because before I published the book, I told the CPJ and everybody else that was, I was going to publish it. And I said, listen, if they kill me, if they arrest me, if they disappear me, anything, you have all the evidence here, and yet you have all the evidence of who did it. So my team was ready for anything that happened to me. People thought I was crazy, and I might be, but after you see the crimes they are committing against our children all over the world, you cannot stay quiet. You cannot, and you should not. Nobody should. So um, I ended up, instead of being dead, because all these people started calling Amnesty International, the CPJ, and everyone. So they called the governor, the president, and everyone say, if Lydia Cacho doesn't arrive alive to, to prison, where they were taking me, uh, you'll, you're in trouble. So they took me to prison. I was in prison after being tortured. And uh, they beat me inside uh, prison, asking me if and when they let me out seven years later, um, I could promise and sign a document uh, in which I would say that I was treat, uh, treated properly and my human rights were not violated. I said, of course, of course, I will never talk about it. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, my lawyers were really good. And they let me out on bail. After one year, I uh, won that battle. They put a lot of civil cases against me to destroy my economy, to take my house away, and things like that. That's what they do. And uh, finally, we won the case against the leader of that child pornography network. And he got the first sentence ever in Latin America for child pornography and human trafficking, child trafficking. <laughs> And the sentence is for 113 years, which is unbelievable for, for the continent and unbelievable for Mexico, of course. Um, I still, you know, they, they still want to kill me, of course, because they don't like me. But anyway, um, three years ago, I finally got the possibility to get incarcerated, the, my two, the two policemen that tortured me. And they are now sentenced to, to five years because torture of journalists is apparently not a very big crime in Mexico, but they are in jail now. And I testified against them. And now uh, I won an international court, and um, this, uh, the, the governors and the businessmen are now on the run because they have arrest warrants internationally. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm not 
I cannot be at home right now because they don't like what I did and what I keep doing, which is telling the truth. I've been writing about the uh, same issue and other issues as human trafficking from all over the world and trying to investigate all the mafias and how they link to bankers through money laundering, how they link to um, political parties and how they use children and why child pornography is increasing all over the world. And to do so, I need social media. And what happened to me in 2003 when they thought this wasn't going to grow, and when I became a hacker and I thought this is gonna be a one-time thing, uh, it became a big part of my job. And that's why I trained so many young journalists to do things like that. Because back then, after I got out of jail and my case became international, I started getting all these awards because I was like the crazy Mexican that was like a shiro and this and that. And I became the story. I was really angry because I was like, oh my God, I, wanna, I don't want to be the story. I want to be the one that tells the story of the lives of others, the, 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 the importance of saving their community and their children and uh, the women and the men and stopping wars and things like that. I don't want to be the story, but I became the story. So I decided to use it, right? Especially to train journalists. And uh, after the, I think it was the Washington Post or the New York Times said uh, that I was the, um, the hero of Mexican journalists, journalism in Mexico, and I was so ashamed of that. And then one day I just took over that and I said, if, if Mexican kids or Mexican journalists need a hero, then let it be. You know, I will be a hero for them because otherwise the narco uh, leaders or the criminal thugs or the corrupted governors are the heroes. So the guys who are killing thousands of people all over Mexico, uh, portraying these narco movies and narco series are becoming heroes. So we need more heroes in other places and we should be aware of that. So anyway, uh, while I was doing all my work as a journalist, uh, at the beginning of uh, getting out of jail, I started getting all these messages um, to my, through my email. Because back then, I used to use Yahoo. I don't know, some, if somebody uses Yahoo, well, you know. Uh, <laughs> or Hotmail, you know, change. Anyway, I used to use Yahoo, and when I published my book, I thought, well, you know, nobody's gonna read it. Who wants to read a book about a network, an international network of the rich guys, politicians that are doing child pornography? Nobody wants to read that. So I published my email there in the book. And, and then all of a sudden, from three, it, my book went from 3,000 uh, published books to uh, one million books sold, only in Spanish. So all these people started writing to me and saying, my daughter disappeared, my, my, my little boy disappeared, and he, you know, and so I had like more than 100 cases every day. And I was like, people think that I am like a sort of, some sort of general district attorney for the citizens and I'm, a, I'm only a reporter, right? Um, so I decided to create a network which I was like sharing all the information with people that, that knew how to find girls and boys in different states in Mexico. And all of a sudden, this guy from London writes to me and he said, listen, Lydia, we have to create an international network to find these kids. So we did. So there were a big community of hackers helping each other to find kids and to find the pedophiles that were taking the pictures of children from their social networks, from their parents' social networks, and finding where they lived and, try and taking them away. So then I asked myself, there is something wrong with police around the world, which is they are trying to, they have the Amber Alert, they look for children all over the world, but they look for the guys who are raping them or disappearing the kids, but they are not looking for all these children that are, the, the millions now of children that are in, in child pornography all over the networks. So that's what we decided to do, to look for them, and we do. 
we look for them and we, in some cases, in some countries, we help the authorities to find them. And we have found a lot of children that have been kidnapped by child pornographers, and especially by human traffickers that want to, from selling organs to uh, trying to sell them for sex. Um, now, Mexico, Russia, and the US are the three biggest producers and consumers of child pornography in the world. So we have a task here in front of us, and it has to do with good journalism. And how do we use social media in order to find out what's going on? We can use it the better way we can, which is never, never sharing a, a story, or prof a profile of someone that is uh, sharing child pornography in Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. They do, do all the time, even though you wouldn't believe it, they do it all the time. What we do is we gather all their, all their data and then we share it with different uh, people, activists in different countries where they are at. And then uh, we write stories about these guys. And then they, in some countries they are arrested, in some countries they are not. But um, a lot of journalists, especially my editor-in-chief of the newspaper I used to work for, they fire me because I'm a li um, <laughs> liability, apparently, because they want to kill me. Um, and they don't want to defend me. Nobody wants to defend a journalist like me or like 100 more in Mexico that are doing things like what I do. Um, so when he fired me, he told me, you know, you are doing the wrong thing. You are supposed to be, you are a wonderful journalist. You're, you're an amazing storyteller. You should be there, you know, in the trenches, uh, interviewing the women and the men and going there and interviewing the uh, drug lords and doing the work that you know how to do. You have all these books, all these awards. You're wasting your time. You're not an activist. You are a journalist. And I look at him and I'm like, how old is he? And I'm like, how old are you? And he goes, I'm 72. And I'm like, OK, you're a journalist and you're sitting in your desk. You've been sitting in your desk like for 30 years. I've been a, a reporter for 30 years. I hardly sit in my desk, ever sit in my desk except for writing my pieces. Every, all the rest of the time, I'm traveling and investigating and listening to people and documenting and get, gathering true facts and, and, and evidence from everywhere and taking pictures. And I am a do-it-all woman, as most journalists are. Um, and I said, so you're telling me that the narrative and the journalism that you learned 50 years ago is the one I should reproduce now? And I thought he was going to go, no, Lydia, yes, we have to discuss this. And, you know, the answer was very funny for him. He just laughed at me and he said, listen, if you think you're going to change the world, you are crazy. The world will never change. And I said, listen, the world has changed. You are a very, very famous journalist and editor. And you have never won an award. And I am the most awarded journalist in Mexico, and I'm a female. Um, <laughs> I started uh, writing when I was 23, and there weren't supposed to be women in, in um, any newspaper, except for the secretaries that we was, used to be uh, forced to wear miniskirts. So here we are. 60% of all journalists in Mexico are female. Things have changed a lot. Most of us, most of us use internet to do our work. I have been threatened a lot, of course. I get threats, all kinds of threats. For example, recently a governor said that I shouldn't be taken seriously because in somebody posted a photo of me in her Facebook wearing a bikini. So I shouldn't be taken seriously because I wore a bikini. And um, they, from that, to insults, then rape, um, threats, and stuff like that all the time. I get it. And now with the new president that is like Trump in Spanish, 
um, we're getting what we're getting exactly the same thing. It's like worse and worse. He's trying to discredit the media all the time. He's discrediting everyone that is critical of his office and critical of the, the problems, specifically the violence against uh, women and children in Mexico. He's denying everything. And we are right now working on trying to bring him to understand that he cannot deny the truth. But um, what I do, basically, aside of uh, being in a, a good investigative reporter and writing books and listening to people, is teach people to be responsible to use uh, internet. Where whenever they are surfing, whenever they are sharing, they can do it in such a way that they can help others. So I decided to write a children's book. And it's, um, it, it's not a children's book because now I found out that people are using them in schools and then a lot of people that are like 30, 35 or 40 are buying the book and reading it because they think it's very useful. And it's a book about brave kids, brave girls and boys in school that find out a girl has disappeared from school and this girl disappeared because she was posting her photos in, in Facebook and then within the story, which is you know a short story, um, an investigative girl and boy, they, they just go there and they find out what happened to the girl because they are very savvy in, in you know, surfing the internet, in networking, and then they find where the girl are, is and they go to the police and tell the police. And then all of a sudden I have been invited to go to all these schools from Mexico to Panama to talk about the book with students that are fascinated by the book. And the trick of that book is very simple. It empowers them. It's not a book about scaring children and telling them nothing is gonna happen, you are trapped in this hell of an uh, internet and nothing is happening. It's about what they just talked about. It's about what Maria just talked about. It's about all the solutions that we have found to save lives to save our own lives and the lives of others. It's about the solutions that we find every time we type some, something in the internet to help somebody that has been abducted or a journalist kidnapped or, or somebody that is in danger somewhere in the world. It's about funding like 10 bucks a month, a month a, a news outlet that is different, that is doing inve good investigative reporting, for example, anywhere in the world including creating ones in your own community, of course. It's about going back to the basics of ethics, creating a new narrative, which we have been doing, and we have to pick it up everywhere around the world, take the good examples of what works, and then go for it. Help that, believe in that. And then it's also stop complaining about the situation from your desks, please. <laughs> My father asked me, he knew I was coming here, and he goes like, mijita, my daughter, my little daughter, he called me mijita, and he goes like, please, don't talk about the mobsters this time. And I'm like, yeah, dad, I promise I won't. I swear now I bet he's like in Facebook like looking for me like, oh my gosh, she's talking about it. He said, please talk about global warming or something like that. <laughs> you know, the worst that can happen to you is they can say, oh, she's so, you know, she thinks you want to be a Greta Thunberg, but like older. <laughs> um, but uh, my dad asked me to be safe and I do, I do stay safe. I run away. Uh, right now, I'm running away from home because I don't want to be killed, basically. And I want to go back eventually, or I'm, I'm, I also want to keep on investigating from wherever I am. I have a lot of work everywhere in the world. Um, it's very tough. Sometimes, of course, I cry a lot. I feel lonely. I spend more money than I have, so I have to work a lot. Um, but I think it's worth it. I absolutely believe that this is an important moment for humanity. 
and it has to be to do with the fact that we have to go back to repeating one uh, once a day at least the word ethics and values and if we don't we will waste our own times and maybe the lives of many many people so thank you so much <laughs>